Okay, is everybody there? Yes, Mrs. Powell, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Kumar Sumit will defend the academic thesis explaining risky driving behavior among the young motor riders in Manipa, Karnataka, India, a psychological study on objectives for educational interventions. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pro Rector. I would now like to take your permission to share my screen. Can I proceed? Is my screen visible? Yes. A very good afternoon to all of you. Dear Pro Rector, dear members of the committee present, dear families and present, dear families and friends present. In the next few minutes from now, I would like to give an overview of my PhD thesis titled Explaining Risky Driving Behaviors Among the Young Motor Riders in Manipal, Karnataka, a Psychosocial Studies Objective for Educational Intervention. Now, it is beyond any doubt that it is beyond any doubt that road traffic injuries and crashes have emerged as one of the latest public health threat in 21st century in India. And as per the data, road traffic injuries and fatalities are the sixth leading cause of death in India. The same report says that every hour, 17 people die because of road traffic injuries and fatalities in India. Now, India being a developing country, not everyone has access to motorized four-wheeler, thereby major chunk of the population uses motorized two-wheeler for day-to-day -day commutation. A motorized two-wheeler is much more vulnerable for road crashes as they are directly exposed to any kind of obstacle or any other vehicle. Also, 50% of crash involved in the riders are in the age group of 18 to 30 years. So this is not only an emotional loss to the family, this is also an economic loss to the family as well as a nation. So, you know, like this is about the introduction, which actually talks about the basic few data related to road crash in India. The study setting is based in Manipal, a beautiful coastal town in southwestern India in the province of Karnataka. Manipal is home to Manipal Academy of Higher Education, which hosts students from 60 countries of the world and also all across India. For the population of Manipal is 60, the population of Manipal is 50,000. In that, 30,000 population consists of the young student. So thereby, it can be very well argued that in the study setting, the major chunk of population are young students who are in the age range of 18 to 25 years. In this slide, it can be seen the location of Manipal in the map of Karnataka and two pictures which actually depicts about the traffic scenario in Manipal. Moving on to the research object. Moving on to the research objective, the research objectives of my PhD, of my PhD thesis can be broadly classified in or can be broadly divided into three categories in the Karnataka over a period of time. In the next level, we have tried to understand which are the most prevalent risky riding behaviors that explains those road crashes happening in Manipur. In the third level, we have tried to understand the psychological precursors or the factors underlying which actually triggers this risky riding behavior. I would like to mention at this point over here that traffic psychology is a very, very new concept in India. Now, moving on to the study, the first study, we tried to explore the fatal, we tried to explore the characteristics of fatal road crashes in Manipal. So what we did, we got the data from the police authority, the fatal road crashes data from 2008 to 18, and we did some statistical test. And what we came to know that exceeding beyond the speed limit, consuming alcohol and riding, going ahead and overtaking are the main characteristics of fatal road crashes. In this study, we have also used a technique, a statistical technique called as time series analysis, which is actually a technique used for doing any kind of prediction. So we had this monthly data, fatal crashes data from 2008 to 18. And after doing this statistical analysis, we came to know that there'll be an increase in 4.5% in the number of fatal road crashes by the year 2025. Now, what is the study implication? Uh, at the end, ultimately, in the Indian setting, every day, everything boils down to an infectious disease. Why? Because infectious disease goes from one person to another person. So now it is high time that the policymakers should take cognizance of the situation that road injuries and road traffic fatalities are one of the 
latest emerging public threat and they should do some kind of localized intervention as soon as possible. In the next study, we have tried to assess to what extent risky riding behaviors are associated with self-reported crash involvement and violation. So in this study, we have used a scale called as motorcycle rider behavior questionnaire. At the time when we conducted this study, to the best of our knowledge, this scale was not tested in India. So we did a cross-sectional survey among 300 young motor riders who were in the age group of 18 to 25 years. And five categories of risky riding we actually came to know from this study. Definitely one is traffic error. Example can be you go quite wide from the corner. Control error, need to break or back off when negotiating a bend. Stunts, attempt to do a wheelie. Protective equipment can be a motorcycle boots or protective clothing. Or violation can be exceeding the speed limit. This study also reveals that the factor structure of this scale, motorcycle rider behavior questionnaire, is by and large consist, is consistent with the studies, motorcycle rider behavior questionnaire studies, which have been done in other settings, whether it is Turkey, whether it is Australia, or whether it is in Nigeria. The study also revealed that riders who, the study also revealed that the riders who reported violation and stunts have experienced near crash experience in the past three months and also have paid fines for traffic violation. In the next study, we have done a focus group discussion among 35 young riders. So altogether, we did five focus group discussion, two among the males, two among the females, and one was a heterogeneous, so which consists both of males and females. So we have tried to understand the in-depth understanding of perceived causes of road crashes from the perspective of young riders. So the themes or the findings which came out from this study, the first theme is, Risky riding behaviors, which are considered to be as safety critical, risky behavior observed among young riders, environmental factors for crashes, and suggestions for crash reduction. And conclusion, the findings from the first two studies were actually again confirmed in this study, and which are those speeding, alcohol use, using mobile phone while riding, and not using helmet. And the reasons for this can be basically explained under three broad domains. One is personal related factors, poorly maintained bikes, and absence of basic infrastructure. In the next study, again, to the best of our knowledge, this kind of a study has not been conducted in India. We have tried to understand the perception of the traffic police personnel as far as young rider risky riding behavior is concerned and what are their suggestions to negotiate or mitigate that. They have a very unique position in the society to judge because their suggestions can be very much informed, very much uh, you know, like based on evidence and some kind of intervention can be done. So altogether, we conducted 17 in-depth traffic interviews among the traffic police personnel. And the themes which emerged out from this study, one was definitely the current traffic scenario. What are the common risky riding behaviors of observed among the young riders? What are the determinants of risky riding behaviors? What is currently happening related to road safety? And finally, what are their suggestions? And again, the basic, the main findings, of this study again confirmed the findings which were there in the previous studies. One is definitely the personal related factors, infrastructure issues, enforcement issues, lack of uh, integrated policy and negligent parenting. In the next study, we have used theory of planned behavior to understand the psychological precursors that predict rider behavior for speeding, helmet usage, performing stunts and use of mobile phone. Again, to the best of our knowledge, this kind of a study has not been conducted in India where they have used theory of planned behavior to comprehensively investigate more than one risky riding behavior. Theory of planned behavior is the most commonly wide theory which is used in psychology to predict behavior. It consists basically of three very basic elements, attitude, subjective norm, and perceived behavior control. Attitude is degree to which a person favorably or unfavorably evaluate that behavior of interest. Subjective norm is, up to what extent the society will approve or disapprove my behavior. Lastly, perceived behavior control is how much at ease or difficulty I am in, in performing that behavior. So altogether, we conducted a cross-section survey among 238 young riders who were in the age range of 18 to 25 years. The finding from this study, speeding behavior was positively correlated with all its psychological determinants. The riders consider it fairly normal to use mobile phone while riding. They don't consider it risky at all. And at the same point of time, they do think that stunts, performing stunt is dangerous. And as far as helmet usage is concerned, they do understand the benefit of helmet usage while riding. But I would also like to add one caveat over here that many people or many young riders don't want to use helmet because our study setting is one of the most 
humid place in India. So because of this helmet usage, sometimes it becomes less. So this is by and large the findings of the last study. Now the recommendation coming out from this PhD project can be clubbed into two, practical recommendation and policy recommendation. In the practical recommendation, we'd like to mention that it is a high time that we should engage young riders for behavior change program. Till the time behavior is targeted, not much desirable result will be achieved. And how it can be done? One of the very basic thing can be a simple behavior change communication program. Other can be, we can go a little bit level, we can go a little bit at a higher level and do much more organized program, something like intervention mapping. The other can be, there can be some local and cheap software which can be developed to prevent mobile phone usage while riding. I would like to give an example over here. Recently, the German company Bosch, actually they funded a hackathon in Bangalore where many of the engineering students, they gathered and they tried to develop some kind of a very localized kind of technology as far as motor vehicle safety is concerned. Also in the third study, many of the participants told me that why can't we collaborate with the engineering school and get their students' opinion and develop some kind of a localized safe system technique. Looking at the policy recommendation, one is licensing procedure. To be very frank, the licensing procedure in India is very lenient. Until the time the licensing procedure becomes strict and stringent, the quality of the rider coming on the road is very much questionable. And how we can do that? One of the very simple way is to uh, take ideas from the program, which is there for licensing program in Australia. In Australia, there is something called as graduated driving license program. And also this kind of a program exists in many countries of the Western hemisphere. So that also something which can be done in India as well. Motor vehicle safe system. Yes, there is something called as advanced rider assistance system, anti-lock braking system. These are the technologies which are used in some of the countries and also it can be incorporated in India. In India, we have something called as automated headlight on, but that is only for the vehicle which came after April 1, 2017. Road safety information database, the government do say about national road safety information database, where they say that to enhance the quality of crash data investigation, its uh, collection, uh, transmission and analysis. But again, I would like to say here that because of COVID pandemic, everything has taken a backseat and we have to see how it will actually propel in future. Strict law enforcement. I would like to mention one very important thing over here, which is a data. In India, just 70,000 traffic police personnel are managing a vehicle fleet of 200 million. So you can imagine how much workload they have. So it is very difficult for them to do some kind of law enforcement and that too strictly. So one suggestion which can be given from this is that why can't be some of the students can be given some kind of authority by the police so that they can do some kind of a random check and they can bring some kind of changes at the local level. And also there is a concept of e-ticket or traffic ticket, which actually reduces corruption at all level. So that also can be expedited all across India. Road infrastructure improvement, yes. Uh, Indian roads, they are not as good like the roads which exist in the Western world. And many times a fatal crashes or even just a crash road crash happens because of bad infrastructure. So it is a high time that the roads which are not in a good condition and other infrastructure uh, can be improved at least at the local level. One other thing can be India can also think of adopting something called as ITS, Intelligent Traffic Management System. So that also can make the traffic much more uh, coherent and much more easy to manage. Finally, to conclude, uh, there is no doubt that this dissertation contributes to the knowledge of crash data investigation, which is a very new concept in India and how it can be used in other settings of India, particularly the university town where my study is based to understand the trends, distribution and causes of fatal road crashes. And also there is a need of targeted intervention in form of an integrated policy approach. Road safety is a multi-sectoral field. It's not only medical science. It's not only dependent on the traffic police. It's a multi-sectoral field. So all the sectors should come together and then have some kind of deliberation, have some kind of intervention to bring about some behavior change among the young riders. And lastly, this dissertation highlights the importance of strict licensing procedure, safe system, road safety information database, strict law enforcement, and road infrastructure improvement to achieve the mission of Vision Zero. Thank you very much. I would now like to hand over the dais to the pro-rector. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. The opposition will now be open, opened by Professor Fred Zelstra, Professor of Work and Organizational Psychology 
at Maastricht University. Thank you, Mrs. Prorector. Dear candidates, uh, first of all, I would like to compliment you with your thesis. Um, you have addressed a very societal relevant topic. Uh, traffic accidents is important, and as I understand, it's a big deal, a big issue in India. Um, I also liked the, the cover of your uh, thesis. Uh, it actually illustrates um, my next question to a good extent. Um, in your thesis, you primarily focus on behavior, behavior of drivers. Uh, and as a consequence, you are using the theory of planned behavior. Um, however, uh, the, the cover of your thesis also illustrates and explains that it's not only behavior, but it's also circumstances and context in which people uh, operate. The uh, behavior of other drivers, uh, potholes in the road, as you also described in your thesis. Um, so therefore, I was wondering whether an alternative model, and in this respect, I'm uh, thinking of James Reason's uh, Swiss cheese model, uh, would also be helpful in explaining uh, the results. Uh, I'm not sure. But are you familiar with uh, the Swiss cheese model, James Reason model of causing errors? I give you in, in a few a few words. Basically, a Swiss cheese is a cheese with all kinds of holes. According to uh, James Reason, uh, all the holes should be aligned in a certain way before an error accident can happen. So it, it emphasizes also the role of circumstances and context. So I would like to hear your thoughts on whether this alternative model could also be useful for your study. And also then, um, if so, whether the conclusions would have been different. May I have your thoughts on this? Our dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the behavior aspect of the young riders is by and large addressed in the last study where we have used the theory of planned behavior. And we have investigated the four risky riding behavior that is uh, speeding, helmet usage, mobile phone usage and performing stunts. In the first study, we have definitely tried to understand the basic characteristics of fatal road crashes by retrieving the data from the police authorities and doing some kind of an analysis over here. So I would not say that my thesis exclusively focus on the behavioral aspect because the first study definitely tries to do some kind of a epidemiological diagnosis at the ground level, tries to understand the characteristics of fatal road crashes and how crashes have evolved in Manipur, which is a, a small coastal town, but has developed a lot from last 20 years. So that we have tried to investigate. now. Coming to the question about the Swiss cheese model, definitely that could have been an alternative, you know, like which can be used in future research to understand the driving behaviors much more uh, comprehensively or maybe in a way which is may not be have been addressed by the theory of planned behavior. And I'm not well very, I'm not aware about the Swiss cheese model. Uh, so like, uh, uh, but yes, in our study, we have uh, investigated other things also, the characteristics apart from the behavioral aspect as well. Thank you, but um, I did not say that your thesis was exclusively focusing on behavior, but it had a very prominent place for behavior. Whereas the cover of your thesis also emphasizes the context elements. So uh, the, Swiss, the Swiss cheese model or James Reason's model of causation of errors gives a better, higher emphasis on contextual factors. So in, in that sense, I think uh, your conclusions will be more or less the same. Because in your conclusions, you also address not only behavior, but also contextual aspects, policy measures, and so on, and so on, and of course the police force. So I would say maybe the Swiss cheese model would have been even a better model for your study than the theory plan behavior. Do you agree with me? Uh, I, uh, yes, I agree with you. And uh, this can be a better approach than the theory of planned behavior. And this can be one of the academic application of this study, that the future research, uh, which as I mentioned that traffic psychology is a very new field in India and the future research can actually use this model to understand yeah. the behaviors much more comprehensively. Yeah. And now moving a little bit more to your focus behavior, 
Um, from a psychological perspective, there is also debate on whether, for instance, accident proneness is a personality characteristic. Um, some say yes, it belongs to a personality. Others say no, it's uh, caused by other factors. Uh, for instance, like clumsy behavior. So this would fit better in the theory of planned behavior. So what would be your thoughts on using a more a personality type of approach to the problem? Because you already addressed some characteristics, young, uh, young students, uh, male, et cetera, et cetera, which are typically characteristic of, of an individual. Thank you again for the question. Yes, personality can have a very uh, important role to play as far as risky riding behaviors are concerned. And probably the things which comes within a personality, for example, the clumsy behavior, or maybe like a person who has been born and brought up in a very pampered environment. We mentioned about lack of negligent parenting. So what is happening in India these days that both mother and father will be working. And in a way, the kid, they have more kind of a negligent parenting. So these are all personality traits which can have a direct relation with risky riding behavior. Okay, so this, uh, this factors or this variables can very well fit in the theory of plant behavior and then it can further explain. So in our study of the theory of plant behavior, we have included speeding, uh, helmet usage, stunts, and uh, use of mobile phones. We have not very specifically put go, gone into the details of personality factors, but yes, personality factor can be one level ahead of investigation as far as risky riding behaviors are concerned. But yes, I definitely agree on that point that it can fit in very well with the theory of plant behavior in explaining in a much more detailed manner. Okay, thanks. And one, one last uh, question is, I mean, uh, given the recommendations and given the study population, wouldn't it be much simpler to just raise the age limit to allow to be on a, on a motorcycle? Uh, as such, in India, we do not have an age limit till uh, a person can ride a vehicle because, uh, you know, like it starts at a legal age of 18 and you, there are like instances where people who are even in their 60s and 70s who can actually ride a motorcycle and they do ride it. So as such, there is no any legal bar at which, you know, like they are prohibited to ride a motorcycle or any kind of a motorized two-wheeler. Uh, but, but, yes, but wouldn't that be a solution to raise the bar, the age limit to say, 28 rather than 18 to be able to, to allow to drive a motorcycle. Yes, that can be one of the a very good, a good solution to actually, you know, like reduce road crashes that uh, uh, up till, you know, it can, the, the age can be increased till 28. But that is something which is decided by the government, by the, you know, this Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. And uh, they say that, you know, the, the licensing procedure can be started at the, at the, at the age of 18. But how it can be done at the local level and how it can be done at the, you know, like even at a level higher than local level to make the age for driving at 28 years, that will be slightly a little bit questionable. But yes, that suggestion can definitely be, you know, like uh, taken forward. Okay, thank you. We're back to the pro -director. Thank you. Uh, the position <clears throat> will now be continued by Professor Hermanns, Professor of Transportation Sciences at the University Hassel. Okay, dear candidate, it's my pleasure to attend this PhD defense. Um, and before asking my questions, I would like to briefly share my appreciation with you. So as said, indeed, research deals with a very relevant topic, which is clearly framed in your text. You also use uh, various methodologies um, and yeah, successfully completed five different studies. And also your obtained results are well linked with, um, with existing studies. So I really believe that your thesis contributes to academic knowledge in this field. But as a member of the assessment committee, I would like to pose a few questions to you. My first question is, um, is actually that you collected quite a lot of data among different respondents. So you did a survey among 300 young motorcyclists. Later, you had like uh, 35 riders in the focus group. You also had 17 in-depth interviews with the traffic police personnel. And then in the, in the final study, again, 240 young drivers in a survey. Um, I was uh, mainly interested to, to know um, if you could elaborate a bit more on the sampling method. So how did you select those different uh, respondents and what was your general reasoning behind the selection? Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for the question. 
In the second study with where we have uh, tested the skin motorcycle rider behavior questionnaire, the sample size happens to be 300. And we have used this convenient sampling approach to go ahead with that. So we have visited few of the colleges in the, in the city and where we have identified the eligible participants and then we have gone ahead with the data collection. And this was in the year 2018. And at the same point of time, we have uh, also uh, gone to the regional transport office. Okay, and there also we have spoken where which the office which is responsible for issuing the driving license and also many young people come over there. So there also we have identified, have collected the data. That was for study two, where we have used the scale motorcycle rider behavior questionnaire. And uh, the next focus group study, which we did, and there were 35 young respondents. So we have visited there also the technique was by and large convenient. So we have visited some of the garage, local garage where they repair motorcycles. We have also visited some of the colleges and also other popular hangouts of the students. And there we have identified some of the eligible participants. We also told them very clearly that there is no any incentives which should be paid for participation and the duration to which you will be involved in a focus group discussion will be slightly more than a quantitative study. That was the approach for the focus group discussion. Mm -hmm. The next study where we have interviewed the traffic police personnel, an in-depth interview. So there I had an opportunity and I was lucky enough to meet the traffic police chief. And he gave me the list of all traffic police personnel who are there in the city. And then I contacted them over the phone and whoever were available for the interviews, I have just uh, included them in the study. So I think all uh, out of 38 people whom I contacted, 17 of them uh, gave their consent to participate in the study. And none of the interviews were conducted during the working hours of the personnel. We, I invited them to the college and in a room, uh, we just had their interviews. The last study somehow, uh, the last study somehow uh, like it happened in the period of COVID. So that time also we have used this convenient sampling technique and we try to contact all the people through known contacts, uh, identifying people in colleges in like in other like uh, garage, like who comes to repair their vehicle in garage and from other sources as well. And in that study, we were able to actually identify close to 340 participants, but then yeah. only 238 were able to complete the survey because okay. this online interview or online data collection is slightly a new concept in uh, India, but that we have to do because of the COVID pandemic, which was raging at that period of time. Okay, but I think that that's very clearly explained how, how you use the different, uh, or how you selected the different people, uh, mainly with uh, with respect to um, yeah, the convenient sampling method here. Um, a yeah, follow-up question there is that um, in, the, in the chapter where you describe um, the focus groups, um, and also explain today here that you say that, um, well, there are quite a lot of females in the sample, right? So, of course, when you have a look at at, uh, at risk, um, the, the risk is higher for males. So I, I was a bit confused why you wanted to include so many females in the focus group. Could you explain that very briefly? Uh, thank you again for the question. Uh, with the invent of motorized scooters, uh, which is without a gear, a gearless kind of a scooter, Many females are also, you know, like they ride two wheelers, okay, for day-to-day -day commutation or they go to work or they do go to college. And uh, not only the males, even females also come across accident. But yes, it is very much evident from the literature that it is rather the males who have much more risky riding behaviors. So we also wanted to understand the perception of females also because our setting is a university town and it has got a a vibrant uh, young population with a, almost like an equal representation of males and females to understand their perspective and also get their opinion uh, in the focus group discussion we included females also so we conducted two focus group discussion only with males two with females and one mm -hmm. was both mixed so yeah. many of the verbatims or in many of the qualitative interviews the females have said that the boys have more risky, the, the males have more risky riding behavior. They want to impress us. And, um, you know, they just get the new vehicle from their parents. And, uh, you know, like uh, at the same point of time, you know, like they've always been in a hurry to reach the destination. So that was also like one of the reasons. And there was one other reason which was very much related to uh, uh, like providing consent. Like when I was approaching young respondents, many of the females also provided their consent to participate in the study. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe a final uh, short question. Um, so also in your propositions, you mentioned that 
actually all the different concerned stakeholders should contribute eh, in order to, to improve the situation. Um, I think somewhere in your text, you also mentioned that town planners are one of the uh, relevant stakeholders. So can you can you explain how town planners could contribute? Um, eh, what, what could they do based on the results from your study? Thank you again for the question. Uh, there is something in India called a sustainable transport policy, which talks more about uh, working space and, you know, like the parking space as far as the transportation policies are in, in India are concerned. Now, the roads which were built in India, let's say when it was built in 80s or 70s, the people who built the road, they didn't have even an iota of this thought that after 40 to 50 years down the line, it will become so crowded and the population will increase so much. Now, the town planner definitely have a very uh, important role because they are responsible for road construction. They are responsible for making the, whites, uh, the, the, the roads wider. And also, in a way, they are also responsible for installing street lights or any kind of barriers on the road. So the responsibility of town planner is very important as far as road safety or you know the whole concept of uh, road traffic crashes and their control is concerned in India. So they are involved basically in I can say in the infrastructural providing the infrastructure uh, things as well as road safety is concerned. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Kumar, associate professor at the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. Thank you, Professor. Uh, dear candidate, am I audible? Uh, yes, yes. Firstly, I would like to commend you on an excellent job. It uh, completely reflects uh, the road traffic accident scenarios at this particular uh, level. It is actually a different perspective, probably like uh, never explored before in India. So I really congratulate on that particular part. Now, uh, on your uh, thesis part, uh, like uh, I had a small query, like uh, at the end, uh, you have actually mentioned that uh, like you would be wanting to like uh, propagate all the like uh, details, whatever you have actually like uh, worked out, the statistical analysis and other things, you want to actually share it with the public and create an awareness on road safety guidelines. So like uh, my question is like, what are the different modalities by which you want to create awareness on the public domain, which are actually effective? A dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for the question. Now, one of the very basic uh, way by which it can be done by publishing all the study. But in that case, it is only available by and large to the scientific community or the fraternity. But as far as creating awareness or using this study result to do some kind of awareness at the local level. So one thing is that uh, I was interacting a lot with the police people uh, initially and uh, and also after, you know, like few days from now, I'd like to meet them and then just brief them, brief themselves about my study result. So they can also do some kind of intervention at that level. That can be one of the other thing. The third thing is folk art or the traditional form of art is very popular in this part of India. And in this part of India, there is something called as Yakshgana, which people identify themselves with that. And that is also one of the recommendations which I have proposed in the study. So it's something like this road safety measures or the findings from this study or the other things which are coming out from this study can use this folk art or the traditional form of art as a medium to create awareness. And last and the one of the most important thing in India, social media, because how social media has taken a center stage from last one decade and social media has got immense potential. Uh, sometimes social media used for some unethical purpose as well. But if social media is used for a good reason, it has got a huge impact on the mindset of the young riders. So in this four to five ways, actually, the awareness can be created or the findings of this study can be disseminated. But also I'd like to mention, in my opinion, the folk art or the traditional form of art will be the most suitable or the maybe the most suitable method by which it can connect to the masses in this part of India. Thank you. Thank you on that. Uh, my next question is like, you might be knowing about uh, certain countries like Japan or uh, like Norway or uh, like uh, Netherlands, whichever country it is. So basically, like if you see road traffic accidents are very low and one of the contributing factors is 
they have incorporated road safety measures in the curriculum so like uh, you yourself have proposed that actually it has to be incorporated in the curriculum incorporated at what level it should be incorporated should it be in the preschool level or like should it be in the high school level which grade do you prefer to and why? Uh, thanks uh, thanks again for the question uh, the national road safety policy do say that road safety curriculum should be incorporated but again as i mentioned that because of this covid pandemic everything has taken a back seat in india so the correct level at which road safety curriculum can be incorporated is the time when a young person is almost about to obtain his learner's license or very close to obtain his license so you can say maybe high school maybe when the person is in standard 8 or standard 7 so that can actually teach the person very basic things related to road safety driving related to science and all those things that's why it will not become very difficult for them to obtain the license and this will also serve one more purpose and the purpose is of graduated driving license program so if road safety curriculum is issued at that level the licensing procedure can be much more smooth for them as far as this is concerned at the next level it can be at the college level so they have already obtained the license and they do right but again I would like to quote one uh, verbatim from my study. One of the respondents told me that in Manipal, the students either they come for two or three years if they are doing a master study, or five years if they are doing a graduation. So they actually intend to drive how they drive in their home city. In India, the traffic driving can or the driving can differ from one city to other city sometimes a lot, right? So in that case, actually, what can be done if this road safety curriculum can be incorporated at the college level. So it can actually mitigate those all challenges which are happening there. So in a nutshell, I would like to mention that this road safety curriculum is a very good thing which we need to have in the both school and colleges and it should be incorporated at these two levels. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. So like my next question is, if at all, like you have actually mentioned, uh, like uh, in your thesis per se, that uh, like uh, attitude plays a very, very important role when it comes to like uh, the road safety and other things, the way the kids of the age group of 18 to 25, they actually like act in a different way and maturity of uh, the behavior per se, it actually makes a difference in like riding the vehicles. So like, do you feel that if at all there is an accident and the culprit or the accused of that particular accident is being actually given a behavioral change therapy after the accident, can it reduce the road traffic accident at a later point? Uh, thanks again for the question. Yes, very much. As I mentioned that, uh, uh, these all things are fine, fixing the infrastructural issues, the licensing procedure, the safe system and all. But till the time there is some kind of a behavioral change strategies or programs, not much can be done. So coming to the question raised by you, that if a person has met with an accident or he has actually caused an accident, and if a very basic kind of a behavioral program can be given to him, that can definitely do some kind of changes. And uh, like I would also like to give one example which... Uh, was incorporated in one of the city in Kerala. So in Kerala, in one of the city, what they were doing, where the there was a lot of accidents and all, they were actually putting a three-dimensional picture where a person has bit with an accident and all the blood is gushing out from his body. So it actually, you know, like uh, caution the other commuter who are coming to near to that location. But again, the other thing is it also has something called as fear appeal. It may cause fear among the people. So definitely behavioral change, communication or any for that matter, any behavioral change program can be a much better effective interventions which can be incorporated for riders who have committed the accidents or riders who have met with the road crashes. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, my next question is... Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Could we keep that yeah. for the second round? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so the opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Rao, Professor of Critical Care at Kastuba Medical College. Hi, uh, so mate, congratulations for a beautiful presentation. And uh, I appreciate your efforts in doing a very interesting study. Uh, I'm an intensivist and being an intensivist, I see a lot of young riders you know, getting admitted to ICU after the fatal road traffic accident. 
and it is very disheartening to see the emotional stress the family goes through you know so i would definitely like to know what changes we can bring about to reduce the number of these uh, accidents uh, so my first question to you is what exactly do you mean by a fatal crash um, do you even include patients who are admitted to the hospital uh thank uh, dear highly esteemed opponent thank you very much for the question the term fatal crash in the context in which we have used that a person has lost his life because of accident so it's like let's say a person met with a crash and then there is some kind of head injury he goes to the hospital but after one or two days he succumb to the injuries so in that case if the terminal event or let's say the output of that accident happens to be death so in that context fatal crashes can be considered those who actually recovered from it or those who uh, you know uh, are able to live even after the accident that is not fatal so ultimately like those who are dead because of that road crash that can be considered as fatal road crashes in the study so uh, you have analyzed the various uh, weather conditions that could lead to these fatal crashes so uh, where did you get this data from you know you have mentioned uh, uh, accidents during heavy rains or light rains or cloudy times or sunny times so did you get this data from the police station itself how did you collect uh, this data yes uh, thanks again for the question we actually retrieve the data from the police authorities okay and we actually uh, the data was between the period of 2008 to 18 and it had data on many variables like the number of fatal crashes uh, uh, month wise it has also mentioned about where the accidents are higher whether it is on highway whether on you know like national highways or the uh, you know the city roads whether it is near a movie theater or something more and also the weather condition whether the accidents have happened more in the rainy season or in the summer season if i look at the trend of the fatal road crashes the major chunk or the majority of the road crashes have happened in the peak monsoon season in manipur that is july and august okay so those data were actually retrieved from the superintendent of police office of 2008 to 18 so it had not only the numbers of fatal road crashes but also many other variables like which days it has which in which days it is more much more common and the results say that it is much more common on the weekend days because the students have a tendency to do this weekend party and get together and all and they happens to ride in a very intoxicated condition that also causes crashes okay uh, you have collected data till 2018 and yes. you have predicted that from 2019 to 2025 there is going to be an increase in the percentage of fatal crashes so um, how accurate are your predictions have you compared because now you have the data till 2022 so are they matching with your predictions or has covid brought about any change in the percentage of predictions that you have done uh thanks again for the question we do have we do have collected the data only till 2018 because there were certain administrative issues to get the data of 2019 and then covid came into existence and it was there for 2 years and but still we have used this time series analysis technique and we have done prediction till 2025 and it says that will be hike of 4.5% as of now we have not compared the our prediction with that with the actual data that anyways is one of the thing which is uh, planned for the upcoming weeks or the upcoming months when i uh, met the uh, police people personally uh, covid yes it it has uh, it could have brought some changes because in one of the limitation which we maintain we mentioned in that study that our prediction may be slightly wrong as far as the peak covid years are concerned whether it is 2020 or 2021 because the traffic was drastically reduced and almost all the students they went back home and they were attending classes online so for this two years definitely the prediction there can be a i can say a very remarkable mismatch and that we have surely acknowledged in the limitations of the study but yes it's a very good point mentioned by you uh, it's really very good to match our prediction with the actual data because now the data is available till 2022 at least so that is something which is planned for the upcoming weeks or the months thank you Thank you. So now we continue the opposition with Dr. An Tuan, associate professor in transport and mobility at Vietnamese German University of Vietnam. Thank you, Professor Uta. Um, dear the candidate, thank you very much uh, for the interesting research and uh, a lot of uh, insightful results. 
and highly appreciate uh, what you have done uh, over the past few years uh, covering quite many uh, studies. Um, so, um, and uh, I think the situation in uh, in your city and India is quite similar to Vietnam. So through your analysis, I fully understand uh, the situation and the results and the meaning to the policy making. And now I would like to uh, give you two questions. Maybe the third question I keep for the second round if time is allowed. So the first question is um, to show the practical motivation of the in-depth research on the writer's psychology and behavior. Have you done the review of the existing educational intervention in India and uh, other developing countries, uh, let's say Vietnam? And if yes, uh, can you show some deficits uh, of the intervention that call for the need of the research or it call for conducting the research? That is the first question. Can can you answer my uh, my question now, or want to hear the second question? I will answer it now. Our dear okay. highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for this question. As far as uh, uh, as far as the current intervention, as far as the current interventions are concerned, and as your question pointed out, so as the qualitative interviews, or particularly the you know like uh, uh, towards this focus group discussion. In India, we have something called as National Road Safety Week, which is actually observed every uh, time in the month of January, maybe maybe third or second week, second week of January, depending upon the uh, situation. So we have definitely taken this into account as far as the third study was concerned, sorry, the focus group study was concerned. But yes, there are certain very visible deficit as far as that road safety program is concerned. Now in that program, usually what happens, the the people who are responsible for that, they go to some of the colleges or they go to some of the schools and try to give some very basic uh, road safety, you know, like uh, training or very road safety, very basic road safety awareness. Like, well, you should just put on helmet. You should not over speed. You should not, uh, you know, you should drive at the right direction. You should not consume alcohol and you should ride. But they, as of now, to the best of our knowledge, nothing behavioral is done. Okay, so there is that is one of the deficient, and as I also mentioned, that this road traffic psychology is the most one of the most uh, recent or a very uh, a, a field which is very much in the nascent stage. So road safety awareness week is conducted is the existing program which happens in the month of January, but the deficit into it is that it doesn't deals with the behavioral component, even the basic of the behavioral component. Thank you. Okay, uh, that good. I'd like to move on to the second question. Based on the key result, uh, can you develop the objectives uh, and the concept of the educational intervention? You mean uh, behavior driven uh, educational intervention for changing the behavior and for deterring the risky behavior? I think this question is follow up with the first question. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for the question. Yes, some of the very basic research objective for any kind of future research can be developed on those. So it can be something like we can assess the current things which the authorities are doing as far as road safety weeks are concerned, what all things they're doing. So we can have some kind of a baseline assessment, whether they are teaching about helmets, whether they are teaching about fines or whether they are teaching about mobile phones. So one of the baseline assessment we can have as far as the current program is concerned. And then the next objective, which can be proposed as far as this research or future research can be concerned, we can try to understand the perspective of the people who are responsible for uh, this road safety week, whether it will be a good idea to do some kind of a behavioral change component into that or not. And if so, what all they would like to do? So it can be a kind of a mixed method study, where in the first level, we try to assess the baseline, what exactly is happening as far as road safety week is concerned and in the next level we can go to a qualitative approach where we can interview the people or the stakeholders who are responsible for road safety week that whether they are in the opinion of doing a you know like behavior or incorporating a behavioral component in the 
road safety week and if so which all the behavioral component around how they are going to do that so in this way it can be some of the research objectives can be framed for uh, future research for example uh, if you say um, some behavior is very risky and is likely contribute to the fatal crash um, then the educational intervention should focus uh, address such a uh, risky behavior as the first priority or the first stage. Uh, then, um, as you pointed out, um, many factors contribute to the um, intention and the risky behavior uh, as reported. Uh, so you can find out which are the most critical, like let's say, uh, as you mentioned, the attitudes, how to change the attitudes. Uh, Mm, uh, and um, uh, and how to uh, how to say how to um, how uh, by um, and how to change their uh, perceived control behavior um, to have reduced uh, speeding behavior or uh, risky overtaking so on and so forth. I think. Um, such as just one example of how to frame up the objective and the, uh, how to say the concept or the roadmap for the educational intervention program in India, in the home country, uh, in the home cities. Uh, so I hope uh, through this discussion um, and after this meeting, uh, you can further uh, improve the uh, report of the dissertation because it has a, it has a major outcomes um, output uh, take away from the uh, PhD research. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you and uh, all the best luck. Thank you. Uh, so the opposition will be uh -huh. continued by Professor Betz, uh, Professor of Transportation Sciences at Institute for Mobilität, Universität Hast. Thank you. Thank you, Prorector. Um, dear candidates, um, first of all, I want to congratulate you with your excellent work on, on a society very relevant topic, especially in, um, in India. I prepared uh, two questions for you. Um, the first question um, discusses helmet use. As you say in your, uh, as you explain uh, thoroughly in your thesis, you say it's um, socially desirable and that people are wearing a helmet. And that could be a reason why people, um, when they were surveyed, answered in that way. So maybe not honestly, but more a socially desirable answer. My question would be, um, the people who did so, um, would this be uniformly distributed or would it be skewed? For example, that people who are um, be involved in more risky behavior are more willing or more inclined um, to answer um, in a social responsible way. And secondly, regarding helmet use, um, I want to discuss the, the, the moral, herald, moral hazard uh, issue that uh, due to helmet use, and maybe they uh, uh, say we were wearing a helmet, that they are um, more inclined to be involved in risky behavior. Could you discuss this a little bit? Uh, dear highly esteemed <laughs> opponent, thank you very much for the question. Now, coming to the first uh, point which was raised to you, that is more of a skewed distribution. The people who have even though they don't wear helmet and they say that, well, I do wear helmet because of the social desirability or because of the social uh, compulsion. So that is more of a skewed distribution. And uh, the second thing, the second thing which I'd also like to mention is that uh, uh, like as far as uh, helmet usage is concerned, uh, uh, only a specific section of people like uh, who actually rent vehicle or anything as such, you know, they told like, you know, like when they rent a vehicle, the rental agency don't provide them a helmet or they say that if you wear a helmet, we are having a fear that our hairstyle will be spoiled. And this happens to be one of the wettest uh, place in uh, India. So these were two of the barriers which were very much associated with the, you know, like uh, as far as helmet usage is concerned. But the first part is 
uh, very much skewed. If I could kindly request, could you please repeat the second question? Yeah, because um, people are inclined uh, to, to answer it's a social responsibility in a social responsibility way, and they are wearing a helmet, you can have some issues which is called in the economical literature moral hazards. And because they feel more safe because they are wearing a helmet, and they are inclined to be involved in more risky behavior. Would you think that this is also the case for the people you are studying in your survey? Uh, thanks again for uh, uh, mentioning this question. There is definitely a tendency that people do think, especially the risky riding behavior, that if they wear helmet, they are very much safe. A helmet will never protect a person from a head-on injury. Or suppose if there is a head-on collision, you know, like even if a person is wearing helmet, uh, definitely it will be quite fatal. And also some of the, uh, when I was talking to some of the traffic police people, they told to me that uh, even though in some of the fatal crashes, the young riders, they were wearing helmet, but they met with a fatal road crashes because there was either a head-on collision, it was of a very severe in nature. So that definitely can be one of the very valid, valid point. But specifically, we have not addressed in our study, like whether we have not asked any questions related to that, that do you feel that if you wear a helmet, you are protected all across? No, nothing will happen to you. Any kind of accident will not be very fatal. So we have uh, not addressed uh, as such this uh, component in our study. But yes, in the second study where we have used this motorcycle rider behavior questionnaire, I would like to mention that the original motor ride, motorcycle rider behavior questionnaire doesn't have questions related to helmet phone, helmet and mobile phone usage. So we have actually incorporated some of the questions related to that. In okay, and then um, a short, very short second questions to, to conclude. Um, you indicate in your uh, policy recommendations, and uh, you give a few examples where you clearly refer to uh, improvement of infrastructure, um, you um, focus on enforcement and so on, but you're not focusing on behavioral change. Uh, only you, you focus it on, on a practical recommendation, while I would assume that the policy recommendation as a result of your thesis would be more, okay, behavioral change is utterly important at changing towards a safety culture. Why you didn't uh, mention that uh, in a more explicit way and just focusing on, yeah, on the practical, so more the, the personal recommendation, but for, but for policy reasons, you think that um, we can gain more from other things like enforcement, uh, change in infrastructure, improvement in infrastructures and so on. Uh, thanks again for the question. It's a very valid point that we have mentioned about the behavioral change strategies only in the practical recommendation. We have not mentioned that in the office where they issue the uh, license, they're having this concept of stimulator where, you know, like it, it will be like a more kind of a, you know, like a drive, a live driving experience. So they know that, you know, like the behavior can be improved, but yes, it's a very valid point. And we could have included that in the uh, policy recommendation as well, which is now only in the, in the practical recommendation. I totally agree with you on this. Okay. Thank you very much. Ora asked. Kumar Sumit, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. Uh, I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return. Thank you very much. So we're waiting for
please proceed. Um, Kumar Sumit, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Reuter is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Dear candidates, first I would like to ask you to answer the following question. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I will. Thank you. You've seen I put on my gown because this is a very special moment, I even to come put on my hat with the sound system. It looks a bit strange, but that's it how it is. Um, by the authority, vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Kumar Sumit, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certif certificate from both Maastricht University and Hasselt University, two certificates signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor, and affixed with the official seal of the university if it concerns the Maastricht University degree. The degree will now be shown by the beetle that is awarded to you. Thank you. And maybe we can also see the degree of Hazelt. Well, yes, that's also there. So, wonderful. Uh, dear Sumit, um, Dr. Sukumar, I should say, you have reached the finish line and you did it after hard work. And I will not say too many things now, but uh, we started early in end of 2016. I think we came first in contact 2017. We started the project and then uh, it was quite a struggle to the finish line because of, of course, the COVID pandemic. Uh, the many th new things you had to learn field of psychology, the field of behavioral science, the field of behavior change, the different methodologies you used, but also cope with some very, or not coping, I would say, enjoy some very pleasurable moments. And I really remember the, the birth of your daughter, who is now about two years old. So that was uh, all very nice. It was a real pleasure to work with you. Um, we have said it already in the meeting just before this, um, your eagerness, your enthusiasm, is really something that I will remember, uh, that I will never forget. Uh, you're, uh, you're really a very motivated, dedicated person, researcher. And uh, I really do hope that our collaboration will not stop from now, but will continue. And of course, there are two papers to be published still. So that means that we should, should still uh, co collaborate together in the future. But I hope we also extend beyond that. I also remember my visit to Manipal and your visit here, and that were really very, that are really very fond memories. Um, before I hand over the floor to your promoter at University of Hasselt, Hasselt University, Professor Chris Breis, I would also like to thank him and Fele for his uh, for their co-supervision. Uh, Fele and Chris, without your presence, without your hard work, with your out your really um your 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 way of how to bring so much steps further and how to really get the best quality of a manuscript out there we would not have these beautiful uh, publications already out and this wonderful uh, PhD thesis so also thank you very much for that please chris take the floor well thank you rob uh, for these very kind words uh, but let me first address uh, dr sumit <laughs> dear dr sumit here at EMOP, your story started on the 31st of January, 2017, when late at night, I received an email from Professor Rauter in which he informed me there was an opportunity to start up a joint PhD project on road safety in India. I immediately replied the next day 
indicating that from our side, there was definitely interest in starting up such a collaboration. The PhD candidate who would be allocated to the project was a certain Kumar Sumit from the public health program at Prasanna School of Public Health, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. And the starting idea was to work on the identification of the underlying determinants of risky motorcycle riding in Karnataka, Southwest India, in order to generate evidence-based insights for the development of future interventions targeting road safety. A formal partnership agreement between University Maastricht and Hasselt University was set up and signed with your personal contract officially starting on the 21st of August, 2017. Professor Rater and myself were appointed as your supervisors and my colleague, Dr. Veer Laros as your co-supervisor. All administrative hurdles taken, we met for the first time in person at the office of Professor Reiter in July 2017 to discuss your research proposal and start up the necessary desk research and preparations for the collection of empirical data. I remember from that encounter that you were very motivated and excited to get started on a topic that, even though quite far from your uh, formal background, was unfortunately of personal relevance to you since you lost five of your classmates in traffic. In the period 2017-2019, you further fine-tuned your original research proposal and started up data collection for a first empirical study on the prevalence of risky behaviors and their relationship with self-reported crash indicators. Additionally, you worked on secondary crash data to learn more about behavioral crash causative factors and to forecast um, crash trends in Karnataka for future, future years to come. You attended the Global Challenges in Transport course at Oxford University in 2018, and one year later, you came to IMOP for a three months research stay. Moreover, you gave an enthusiastic presentation at the first international symposium on transportation in emerging countries at Hasselt University. The next three years, from 2020 to 2022, confronted you with big challenges. The COVID pandemic, made data collection for a series of two qualitative studies on the underlying determinants of risky ridership extremely hard. Also, drafting your first academic journal articles was a substantial endeavor, where intensive interaction with your supervising team was necessary in order to find the appropriate writing style. Nonetheless, you managed to hold the strains. Via above BILA application, you were able to extend your project duration until 2023, you gathered and analyzed new data and released your first three scientific publications. Furthermore, you disseminated your work at several national and international conferences on public health and transportation. And last but not least, big changes also occurred in your private life with the birth of your first daughter on the 7th of January, 2021. During the last year of your PhD, you conducted a final survey study on the social cognitive determinants of risky motorcycle riding and prepared another manuscript for submission to a road safety journal. In addition, you compiled your empirical chapters into the dissertation that you successfully defended today. Having to combine your work on this PhD with other obligations at the Prasanna School of Public Health and family life undoubtedly must have been quite a challenge. Also, Having to work from a distance with your supervising team sometimes might have been difficult. That being said, in terms of intensity, your mail pace was pretty high with messages being exchanged almost on a daily basis. Under time pressuring conditions, keeping the balance between the willingness to make progress and knowing when the quality of your work is sufficient to be confronted with peer, uh, peer review can be challenging, something you experienced yourself along the way. Irrespective of all that, I have always admired your motivation and outspoken enthusiasm for what undoubtedly is and will remain an important societal health challenge in India. More research on road safety is definitely necessary and the relevance of your work is to be considered in that context. I personally hope this dissertation will not be the end, but rather the beginning of a continuing effort to promote road safety. Dear Sumit, and I can speak for uh, Rob as well as for Veerle, congratulations once more and all the best in your professional career as well as in your private life.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chris. Thank you very much, Professor Rob. Uh, dear Dr. Kumar Sumit, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I con congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. I hereby declare this ceremony to be ended. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Also, congratulations from my side and also to the supervisory team. Yeah. Writer, Bryce, Foss. Well done. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. 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 Congratulations. Thank you, sir. This is beautiful. Congratulations for all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, dear opponents, uh, dear committee members, thank you very much.